Secretary Blinken, Director Burns, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, Director General Bernicat, friends and colleagues, esteemed members of the Foreign Service family, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and thank you all for being here tonight to celebrate the centennial of both the Foreign Service and the American Foreign Service Association. Not everyone may know that AFSA represents six member agencies, the State Department, USAID, the Foreign Commercial Service, the Foreign Agricultural Service, the U.S. Agency for Global Media, and the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, or APHIS. Now, APHIS are the folks who may seize your prized cheese and fruit at the airport when you return from overseas, <laughs> sniffed out by their vaunted Beagle Brigade. That happened to me on more than one occasion. But in any event, I'm happy to have each of these agencies represented here tonight. We are proud that over 80% of active duty foreign service employees choose to belong to our organization, making AFSA truly the voice of the foreign service. I'd like to thank Director General of the Foreign Service, Marsha Bernicat, for being our gala partner and an enthusiastic supporter of the Foreign Service. I'd also like to thank the AFSA and department staff, without whom this evening would not have been possible. <laughs> Additionally, I would like to recognize our primary sponsor, our friends at the American Foreign Service Protective Association, as well as Ambassadors John Negroponte and Roseanne Ridgway for their generous donations that made this commemoration event a reality. Thank you. We appreciate the Virginia General Assembly members present here tonight, Delegates David Reed and Paul Krizek and Senator Tara Durant for their contributions on behalf of Foreign Service members in Virginia, including the joint resolution commemorating the centennial of the Foreign Service. Thank you for being here. Finally, I'd like to recognize the members of our Centennial Honorary Committee, many of whom are in this room with us tonight. We are saddened by the passing of Ambassador Esther Coopersmith and very glad that Janet Pitt, her longtime chief of staff, can join us in her memory. Where is Janet? Is she here tonight? Well, she was part of our centennial committee and we honor her memory. One hundred years ago this month, the enactment of the Rogers Act combined the diplomatic and consular functions and laid the foundations for a professional U.S. Foreign Service. This act established personal ranks, with pay scales, merit-based hiring and promotions, and a retirement and disability system, along with many other provisions that recognize the unique nature of the Foreign Service, of Foreign Service work. 1924 also saw the birth of AFSA as the professional association of this service. It is thus fitting tonight, we are here together, the State Department and AFSA, to host this event as the joint stewards of the Foreign Service since 1924. This enduring partnership has marked our service as an institution of excellence with a highly skilled workforce that is willing to protect the people, defend the interests, and promote the values of our great country in some of the most dangerous and inhospitable places on earth. So tonight, we gather to celebrate the dedicated men and women of our service whose talents and skills are needed now more than ever. There's no celebration of the Foreign Service without mentioning the support and contributions of our great Foreign Service family members, the children, spouses, and partners, many of whom work at our embassies and consulates abroad. Thank you. They also know what duty and sacrifice mean. I also want to recognize the backbone of our Foreign Service, the tens of thousands of locally employed staff all over the world whose expert advice and dedication to the United States advance our interests, sometimes at great risk to themselves and their families. <laughs> to help us celebrate, we are thrilled and honored to have as our centennial speakers, Secretary of State Antony Blinken, CIA Director William Burns, and USAID Counselor Clinton White. At the end of their remarks, Director General Bernicat will lead us all in a toast. 
But before we hear from our speakers, we'd like to share with you a trailer of, a, of our centennial video that highlights our most valued resource, our people. The full video will be available this Friday, May 24th, the anniversary date of the Rogers Act, on our website, afsa.org. So please take a look at the, at the monitors. Thank you. I'm really proud that we as Americans define our interests, not just in our own prosperity and our own security, but that we also define our good in terms of the world. For every person who's free, for every person who gets to earn a, a decent living and raise their family in a protected environment, that's a safer world for Americans too. We're the first line of defense for America. We're not armed, we're not the military, but we're the first line of defense to protect American interests and also to promote our values. That's incredibly important. It's not just the interests we promote, it's also what makes us Americans. Every country, every assignment, there's something new and interesting and, and exciting. You also are able to make a difference in people's lives. We are about American prosperity, American security, and we are the bridge between the United States of America and the rest of the world. What I think Americans should know about the Foreign Service is that the Foreign Service is just going to continue to evolve and become more diverse and that's going to be better for everyone because once we become more diverse we understand other cultures better and what other governments need in order to make connections. When we do our job well nobody really knows you know and so we're preventing conflict we're promoting trade and peace and prosperity if done well you know it's like a pilot if the plane doesn't crash everything went well and so i think we're sort of these invisible i would say everyday heroes behind the scenes i'm very optimistic about where we're going and i can tell you what has made us the essential nation, as Secretary Albright called us, is the fact that we don't look at challenges and look to run from them. We tackle the issues we see, and I see that in my colleagues every day who put in enormous amounts of time, energy, and effort to addressing impossible situations and making them better. So I'm optimistic. Thank you, I hope you enjoyed that trailer featuring some of the good friends who are here in this room. Uh, and please, please begin eating, please. I, I'd ask you all to begin eating. And now I am deeply honored, I'm sorry Mr. Secretary, not for you, but um, sorry. <laughs> I'm deeply honored to introduce our first speaker who really needs no introduction, and who I would describe as the hardest working man in Diplobiz. Indeed, he is widely regarded as the James Brown of global diplomacy, <laughs> both for his love of rock and roll and his tireless advocacy to safeguard our interests and make the world a better place. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Secretary of State Antony J. Blinken. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. And it is wonderful to see so many colleagues here tonight, to see so many people as I look around the room that I've learned from and looked up to uh, over these years. Um, welcome home to those of you who are coming back to the department this evening. I think, uh, as always, it's particularly fitting to be watched over by Ben Franklin, our nation's first diplomat, who has been called the original father of the, the Foreign Service. Um, in his presence tonight, but uh, also in the presence of, of so many others, I just want to say a few words, mostly of gratitude for the extraordinary group that's here tonight, as well as the extraordinary group of professionals that you each represent. Um, as I'm looking around, as I say, I see so many uh, faces, so many uh, people. I, See my friend John Teft here. I started um, in this department a little over 30 years ago uh, in the EUR front office. It was then the European and Canadian Affairs. The office that I had then, um, its previous occupant had been a large safe. John will remember this. So you get some idea of what the office was like. Um, it had a big wine computer on the desk that barely fit into the room. And as I like to say, it took me 30 years, but I moved up one flight and got some windows. So not bad. <laughs> Tom, 
Thank you, thank you, thank you for your extraordinary leadership of the American Foreign Service Association, which has been such a champion for the Foreign Service and its members for 100 years. Uh, like your predecessor, my friend Eric Rubin, who's here tonight as well, UNFs have been wonderful partners to me, uh, to my team, and on those occasions when we haven't always seen eye to eye, you've never been shy about letting us know. So thank you for that, but I truly, truly value the partnership that we've had. Um, that's the role of unions, and the fact that almost 80% of active duty Foreign Service members have chosen to belong to AFSA, I think that suggests how well you do your job as the voice of the Foreign Service, and I thank you for that. A major reason that our Foreign Service continues to recruit and to develop outstanding talent is because we have an outstanding Director General in Marsha Bernicat. Thank you. Mark. Thank you. Thank you for not just four decades of remarkable service, but for everything that you're doing now to strengthen our workforce, because that is what this institution is all about. And I want to thank Clinton White and everyone at USAID. I get to see this, as so many of you do, going around the world. The place where the rubber really meets the road is with USAID. I've seen the difference that it's making in country after country in genuinely changing people's lives for the better and advancing our diplomacy in the most concrete and so the most powerful ways possible. We're grateful to be in the trenches alongside of you. And then finally this evening, look, I wanted to be known as the man who brought Bill Burns back to the State Department. <laughs> Truly someone who knows the introduction, my friend, my colleague, someone who I've looked up to for so many years. Um, he's doing indispensable, extraordinary work at the CIA. But I think everyone in this room knows that his home will always be here at Foggy Bottom. Bill, welcome home. And it's wonderful to join so many champions and members of our Foreign Service family to honor what has been a century of excellence, dedication, and, yes, sacrifice. I want to especially recognize, as Tom did, all the children, all the spouses, all the loved ones who've made so many changes in your own lives so that a parent or partner could serve. Just weeks after taking office, President Biden came to this department to underscore, as he put it, diplomacy has always been essential to how America writes its own destiny. American diplomacy has indeed always been essential but maybe not always quite so professional. Before the 20th century, our representatives abroad received essentially no training and very little guidance from Washington. Maybe that last part wouldn't be so bad today. But. <laughs> the few envoys who sent dispatches home found their reports, as one historian put it, and I quote, generally ignored and often lost. I'm sure no one in this room can relate to that. In 1889, a respected New York newspaper called for abolishing, abolishing the diplomatic service entirely, deeming it, and I quote, a costly humbug and a sham. So I think we've seen the department's reputation improve considerably in the years after Congress passed the Rogers Act in 1924, unifying our diplomatic and consular service into a single foreign service. with Competitive entrance exams, as you heard, enhanced training, merit-based promotion, retirement benefits. Through hot and cold wars, through democratic waves and technological revolutions, our diplomats, our development experts, have adapted to meet every single challenge. And we haven't just grown from 633 Foreign Service members in 1924 to almost 14,000 in 2024. We've also transformed ourselves in the process. Where we work, what we work on, how we work on it. But the core mission that's animated the service, that core mission has endured, helping our policymakers understand the world and helping the world understand the United States a little better, and drawing on every possible tool to help make the American people a little bit more secure, a little bit more prosperous, a little bit more healthier, a little bit greater access to opportunity. Today, 
we find ourselves at an inflection point. In so many ways, what we do now and in the months and, and few years ahead will likely determine the future for the American people and for the world for decades to come. There is so much change in this moment. And the way we adapt to it, the way we shape it, the way we adjust to it, that is going to have profound repercussions for a long, long time. Geopolitical competitors and emerging powers reshaping the strategic landscape. Problems like our warming planet, the threat of another pandemic, food insecurity, the synthetic drug crisis, irregular migration, displacement. These are just as transformative, and they are affecting the lives, the livelihoods of Americans, people around the world in profound and concrete ways. Emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, quantum computing, holding both incredible promise and possibility, but also posing serious risks to our security and to our values. In this moment, in this moment, I am convinced that diplomacy matters more than ever. And so our diplomats matter more than ever. There's a greater imperative than at any time in the 30 or so years that I've been doing this to find ways to work cooperatively uh, with other countries, other partners. Uh, we know two things. We know that if America is not leading, if America is not engaged, then likely someone else will do it in our place and probably not in a way that advances our interests and values. Or maybe just as bad, or even worse, no one does it, and then you have a vacuum filled by bad things before it's filled by good things. But we know equally that we, we need more than ever to find partnerships, to find cooperation, to find coordination if we're going to effectively address these challenges. And that's exactly where our diplomats come in. You, they, are the ones who are doing it. That's why we're investing in the future of the State Department and the Foreign Service so that we can meet these tests and actually seize the opportunities of these coming decades. And like Marsha, like everyone you heard on the video, I'm confident that we'll succeed because across 100 years of turbulence, of transformation, one thing has remained constant. You, the women and men of the Foreign Service. Your skill, your intellect, your courage, your resourcefulness, your dedication to our shared mission. Now, unlike the Foreign Service exam a century ago, we no longer require a candidate to name the Greek minister who aided the Anglo-French expedition at Salonika. <laughs> Don't worry, no pop quizzes tonight. By the way, that person was Elfitiras Benaziros. <laughs> but whenever I talk to one of our team, whenever I talk to a Foreign Service officer, what strikes me is the extraordinary political intricacies you can analyze, the cultural nuances you can explain, the quick, effective problem solving that you do. And for good measure, you can offer share, often share all of that in Hindi, in Arabic, and Swahili. Alongside our civil service and, yes, our locally employed staff, the lifeblood of any mission anywhere around the world, you continue to do the hard work of diplomacy on the ground, to offer expert advice, to think critically, to push everyone in this department to do the same thing. Whether it's negotiating treaties or trade deals, whether it's delivering vaccines to rural communities, processing passports at a consular window, each of you is a testament to the power of American diplomacy at its best. AFSA highlighted that impact with its Foreign Service Proud Centennial Campaign, asking members to submit experiences in their careers that made them feel honored to serve. Some focused on helping shape events of historic significance, supporting the Green Revolution in agriculture in the Philippines, assisting American citizens in China during the COVID crisis. Many of the submissions, though, were about the kind of exchanges that probably don't make it into the news. The small things that add up to something really big. Handing out food and water in the aftermath of a hurricane or an earthquake. Holding the hand of an American expat in India during his final hours. Dressing up as Santa to bring holiday tear to children at an orphanage in Croatia. And whether it's 1924 or 2024, your ability to connect with people, to immerse yourself in a country, to bridge cultures, to tap into our shared humanity, that is the unique and enduring strength of the Foreign Service. Um, many of us of a certain generation 
used to spend the holiday season doing the same thing because it was unavoidable. If you had your television on at some point during the holiday season, one movie always came on every single year. It's a wonderful life. And for those of you who, who don't remember the movie, um, it's probably my favorite movie of all time, uh, Jimmy Stewart plays George Bailey. And George Bailey's about to take his life at the beginning of the film because he thinks he's been a failure. A failure to his family, a failure to his community, a failure to his town. And an angel taps him on the shoulder and shows him through the course of the movie what Bedford Falls would have looked like if he hadn't been there. And of course, we see a very different reality for Bedford Falls in his absence. And he realizes through the course of the film that in fact, for all that he thought of himself and his own failures, he'd been indispensable to his town, to his community, to his family, to his friends. And I, when I think of that movie, that's really how I think of the Foreign Service and our diplomats, as the George Baileys or Georgette Baileys of this world. Take us, take you out of the picture. It looks very, very different. With you in the picture, it's been, it is, and it will remain so much brighter for all of us. And I thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Secretary Blinken, for those inspirational words and for making the time to be with us tonight. Our next speaker is Clinton D. White, the counselor and highest ranking foreign service officer at the U.S. Agency for International Development. Counselor White is a 22-year veteran of the foreign service and has had a long and illustrious career in the Caribbean, Africa, and Central Asia, promoting sustainable development and democratic governance, addressing food insecurity, and building resilience to natural disasters and climate change. Please join me in welcoming Cl Counselor Clinton White to the stage. Good evening. Thank you, Tom, for the kind introduction, and thank you, Secretary Blinken, for the excellent remarks. I think I speak for all of us here to say we are grateful that you serve as this nation's top diplomat. How wonderful to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Foreign Service and AFSA. It's great to see FSOs from all these agencies. It's great to see CIA Director Bill Burns. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield is also here. She's returned to public service after her long foreign service career to serve as the ambassador to the United Nations. You are an inspiration to all of us. And DJ, DG Bernicat, you have been a mentor to me and you have been a light where there's darkness. And we appreciate and love you for everything that you continue to do. This day is very meaningful to me since I am a Foreign Service Officer and a member of AFSA. I want you all to think about why you chose the path of the Foreign Service. I call it this 10 second moment where something has a profound impact on yourself, a society, or a community. For me, that 10 second moment took place as a child and it has to do with Brussels sprouts. <laughs> so let me explain. So my mother taught me an invaluable lesson about world hunger and poverty at a young age. Like most kids, I didn't like Brussels sprouts. sprouts. So when I went to throw them away, she basically told me, you better eat those Brussels sprouts, which I reluctantly did. But, and then I'm also dating myself. She then cut off a front page of a Time or Life magazine, you know, the ones that had the large covers. And she showed the famine that was taking place in Eastern Africa. 
And then she hung it on our refrigerator door and she told my brother and I to remember these children anytime you think about wasting food. It was a life lesson that inspired me to collect money for UNICEF in those orange boxes when I went trick-or-treating on Halloween. That Time Life magazine cover struck me throughout my life. It eventually inspired me to one day work overseas helping to alleviate poverty. 22 years later, I've had the privilege of serving USAID in Ghana, Senegal, Pakistan, Egypt, Libya, not in Libya, but in Tunis working on Libya, and the Eastern and Southern Caribbean. Since our founding more than 60 years ago, USAID has worked with partner countries to tackle many of the most urgent development challenges of our time. Our 1,910 foreign service officers are posted in nearly every country in the world. Remarkable people who leave home to tackle some of the world's most difficult challenges, including hunger, poverty, infectious diseases, outbreaks, and political unrest. At times, they have to face not only discomfort, but even danger to accomplish their jobs. Something that I can attest to from my firsthand experience and assignments in Pakistan and in Egypt. Secretary Blinken, I especially appreciated the remarks that you gave two years ago on the modernization of American diplomacy at FSI, when you spoke about, and I quote, serving our national interests in what is a rapidly changing and increasingly complex world. Last year at AID, we launched an initiative to help further strengthen our foreign service workforce and support our FSOs to do the difficult work we are asked to do overseas and here in Washington. We have already made strides in augmenting training, mentoring, and professional development. We've also increased transparency in our assignment process. We are going to continue this critical work, and we'll continue this work together. When we think of USAID, sometimes we often forget about our roots and that the international development assistance was as part of the 1947 Marshall Plan, not only to rebuild Europe from World War I, but to diminish the threat of communism by helping countries prosper under capitalism. In 1961, Kennedy created USAID. And in the 1960s, USAID invested in the Green Revolution, where new seed varieties were then released in various countries in Asia and Latin America. USAID implemented much of the program with local ministries of agriculture. The Green Revolution was a stunning success as both a humanitarian program because it ended famine in non-communist Asia and dramatically reduced chronic malnutrition, as well as a strategic one tied to US foreign policy by containing communist expansionism. Today, the return on investment from our development work is immense. USAID currently provides nearly 30 billion in foreign assistance each year. FSOs oversees its implementation, make key decisions, and build partnerships to ensure effective investment of this support. For example, we're fighting hunger and strengthening food security by leading the Feed the Future initiative to strengthen agricultural-led growth, nutrition, and resilience in more than 40 countries across Africa, Asia, and Latin America, in the Caribbean. Our Foreign Service officers practice development diplomacy. Through USAID's convening power, our global footprint, our standing in key multinational, multilateral institutions, and our links to the private sector and our strategic communication channels, we drive collective action far beyond the scope of our programming. We also support locally-led development and we are enacting a set of internal reforms to work more closely with communities to lead, strengthen local systems, and respond to local needs. What a wonderful video that we just previously saw. The longer version includes USAID Foreign Service Officer Jesse Gutierrez, currently serving at USAID Mission Somalia, but based in Nairobi. His story in the AFSA Journal from undocumented to U.S. career diplomat is so inspiring. Like Jesse, our FSOs look more and more like America, and they represent the full spectrum of who we are as a nation. USAID is a leader in the federal government in its approach to diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, but we can still do better. 
Now, as we know, as diplomats and as in foreign service, we travel all the time. I just returned from Atlanta, where we were hosting President Ruto of Kenya. And at this event, I was actually able to meet a mentor of mine, Julius Coles. He is a graduate of Morehouse College, and he began his career with USAID in 1966. He spent 28 years in the Foreign Service. Early in his career, in the 70s, he worked in Liberia, a country with only 50 miles of paved roads at that time. Many farmers were struggling to get through dense forests to sell their produce. Coles and the USAID mission worked with local communities to build farmer-to-market roads, connecting farmers with towns and opening new opportunities for agricultural commerce. FSOs embody the principles we promote, equity and inclusion, and we should never forget that. We work alongside our Foreign Service nationals, locally hired professionals who bring special expertise, language skills, and understanding of the country's context. We can't do our work without them or the civil service, as well as our contractors, frankly, our entire workforce. Our administrator, Samantha Power, I had to put something in there, recently stated that FSOs form close connections with communities, supporting their efforts to identify and dismantle the barriers standing in the way of progress. The true impact USAID FSOs have had across decades of service is impossible to quantify but their stories give us a sense of the mark they've left around the world. So AFSA, happy 100th birthday. Thank you for representing the Foreign Service heroes that came before us and the scores of FSOs who will come after as we continue to serve the American people abroad. And in closing, I'd like to thank all of you for this extraordinary work you do to advance our foreign policy and development goals. All of you, for the marks that you have left, the 10 second moment that helped you save another person's life, or renew hope to an entire community, and ultimately, the world. Thank you. Thank you, Clinton, and thanks Thank you to the USAID teams on the front lines of the many humanitarian crises afflicting the world today. And now for our last speaker of the evening, he is now the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, but for many years he was one of us, <laughs> one of our most skilled diplomats and beloved by many, Director William J. Burns. Well, good evening, everyone. I truly am honored to join all of you for this celebration of the first century of the modern Foreign Service and of the American Foreign Service Association. When I mentioned this event to my daughters last weekend, I told them that I think it's really cool that I've been a card-carrying member of AFSA for almost half its existence. <laughs> they made clear that they think I'm just really old. So thanks for inviting this old guy to this wonderful celebration. And thanks for saving me 15% on my car insurance all these years. And God knows how much of my professional liability insurance. As you can imagine, I need it more than ever in my current role. One of the great privileges of that role is the chance to serve with Secretary Blinken. Like all of you, I find enormous comfort in knowing that Tony Blinken is leading American diplomacy at this crucial moment. Tony's skill, decency, and integrity are incredible assets. His optimism about the power and purpose of American diplomacy is what Secretary Powell used to call a perpetual force multiplier. Tony cares deeply about America's diplomats and the future of this magnificent institution. So Tony, thank you for your remarkable leadership. Thank you for all that you do for the women and men of the Foreign Service and the Department of State. And thank you for our partnership over many years together in government and for a friendship that I will always treasure. Thank you.
it was my extraordinary good fortune uh, to serve for nearly three and a half decades as a career diplomat. The Foreign Service shaped my life professionally and personally. It began right here in this room 42 years ago when I was sworn in as a new FSO. That was the same week I met my wife, Lisa Carty, thanks to the magic of alphabetical seating <laughs> in our A100 class. Our two daughters grew up in the Foreign Service. They were little girls when I was first sworn in on this stage for an ambassadorial job, and amazing young women by the time I retired back again in this room as Deputy Secretary. I cannot imagine a luckier ride in American diplomacy than the one that I had. I saw the end of the Cold War and the depressing road that Vladimir Putin shaped for Russia. I saw endless challenges in the Middle East with occasional glimmers of hope and more frequent dead ends. And by the end of my time as a diplomat, I saw the reemergence of fierce major power competition and a revolution in technology that is changing how we live, work, fight, and compete. I shared that ride with an incredible group of professionals, many of whom are in this room tonight. Their commitment to doing hard jobs and hard places always inspired me. I continued to learn from them and draw from their examples right up until my last day in the Foreign Service. Not a day goes by when I don't think with pride about my time as a career diplomat, and not a day goes by when I'm not reminded of the significance of American diplomacy on the most crowded, competitive, complicated, and combustible international landscape I've seen in my lifetime. It has also been my extraordinary good fortune to serve as director of the Central Intelligence Agency for nearly three and a half years. I share that ride with an equally exceptional group of professionals and patriots, the men and women of CIA. In a new and uncertain era for American statecraft, we do all we can to supply the intelligence and conduct the operations that help American diplomats navigate the challenges before us. That is what we have done in Ukraine, providing early and accurate warning of Putin's brutal invasion, helping brave Ukrainians to defend themselves, supporting the efforts of the President and Secretary Blinken to mobilize a strong coalition, and declassifying some of our secrets to deny Putin the false narratives on which he has so often thrived. Like the State Department, we're working hard at CIA to expand and deepen the network of partners and allies around the world that remains one of America's greatest assets. We're working hard at CIA to adapt and get ahead of emerging technologies to prepare rapidly for an age of strategic competition with a rising China and a revanchist Russia, to help promote American interest in unforgiving parts of the world like the Middle East, and in the face of terrorist threats that will not disappear, and to make sure we're sharply focused on new national security frontiers from global pandemics to climate change, from cyberspace to space itself. And we're working hard to take care of our people and shape a workforce that embodies the richness and diversity of the country we are sworn to protect. My pride in the people with whom I serve at CIA is boundless. The sacrifices they make and the risks they take are rarely well understood, let alone well appreciated. They operate most often in the shadows, out of sight and out of mind. Their quiet bravery and ingenuity an essential complement to the work of the diplomats with whom they serve. There is, of course, much that is different about life and work on either side of the river between our two great institutions, but most important things are the same. Courage, community, and commitment to service. We share a conviction that it's only by staying in the arena that we can advance American interests and values, whether the tool is diplomacy or intelligence. Many years ago, when I was trying to figure out what to do with my professional life, my father, an exemplary career army officer, sent me a letter. I remember one line vividly all these years later. Nothing can make you prouder, he wrote, than to serve your country with honor. I've spent the last four decades learning the truth in that wise advice, first as a foreign service, foreign service officer and now at CIA. 
So on behalf of all of my colleagues at CIA and from this very proud old guy, congratulations on the 100th anniversary of the Foreign Service and of AFSA, and congratulations on the deep commitment to public service that we share. I cannot think of a more important thing to celebrate this evening, and I cannot thank you enough for inviting me back home. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Burns. And now it is my pleasure to invite Director General of the Foreign Service, Marsha Bernicat, to lead us in a toast. I do want to mention that the wine we will be toasting with is from Muse Vine Vineyards of Woodstock, Virginia, owned by Foreign Service Officer Ambassador Sally Cowell. Cowell, Cowell, are you, are you? There you are. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. Thank you very much. And husband Robert Muse. Um, Madam Director General. Good evening, everyone. And happy birthday. <laughs> AFSA colleagues and honored guests. I would like to propose a toast on this very historic occasion, the 100th anniversary of modern American diplomacy. Thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of such a special evening. As we celebrate this Foreign Service Centennial, I'd like to raise a glass to Tom Yazgurdi and our AFSA colleagues, who are extraordinary partners working with us to make the Foreign Service better and stronger, and to the members of the State Department family, and yes, we are a family, who are working to change things for the better for the world. I congratulate all of my colleagues, past, present, and future, for the good work that you have done and continue to do every day. And finally, I sal a salute to all of you who have joined us this evening. Please join me in a toast to the next 100 years. May we be agile, modernized, and ever successful. Cheers and best wishes to you all.